Okay, folks, so very, very welcome everybody to the Dirty Salad Club um, on this. It's, I think it's a springy morning. It's windy, but it's, I saw, saw some daffodils starting to come out on the way drop the kids to school this morning. Um, Farzana and I were just saying we were both out at, in restaurants at the weekend. So there's a nice feeling of things starting to happen and open up. Um, and so hopefully I suppose that extends into all of us and our work lives as well. A uh, very, very well, warm welcome to all our old familiar faces. Old, not in years, um, <laughs> old, I suppose, in terms of membership of the Dirty Salad Club. Um, and a warm welcome. There's a few, few new names I see here today. So for anybody who's here joining us for the first time, uh, Dirty Salad Club is a space for anybody who's involved in working with people in organisations. So whether you're an executive coach, um, whether you're internal in HR or in L&D, uh, this is a place for us to come together and um, to learn from each other but to talk together really. And so these sessions, they're not webinars, they're not just, just a presentation, but it's a space for us to talk about anything that's coming up for us in our professional lives at the moment. So for example, if you're an executive coach, there might be something that you're seeing a lot um, from multiple clients. And you know, this could be a space for you to bring that, uh, to share what, what you're seeing for us to brainstorm together um, about how best to work with that. Um, if you're internal in HR or L&D within an organization, maybe there's something that's really, really high on the agenda for you at the moment. And um, maybe that's something that we can talk together about as a group. The, the name came from the name of a band that Alan used to be in, uh, Dirty Salad Club. But I think it really fits here because the idea with these sessions is they're dirty in a way that this is a space for us to be vulnerable, to maybe share things that we wouldn't share with our clients, to be honest, to be open, to be authentic. Uh, salad in that look this is healthy it's good for us and um, we're learning together and a club again just reiterating that we're all in this together and a lot of us will be experiencing similar things uh, that we're working with with, on, with, on, with our clients uh, that we're working through and this morning we're very lucky to have Farzana with us Farzana Mordebakis who's an organizational psychologist and an executive coach and um, particularly for Zana works a lot with helping people through transitions and through change. And um, so super, super timing, I think, for Frazana's session. And um, it's been lovely working with her so far. And I think Frazana's warmth and personality is really going to shine through and bring a lot to this morning's session. So Frazana, thank you so much. We're really looking forward to this. And without further ado, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Tanya, for this lovely welcome. Hello, everyone. So I'm Frazana, and so uh, and I'm a business psychologist. So today we are going to talk about building resilience in our current reality. So I can't mute, and I don't know if you're hearing my heart, but it's beating so loud <laughs> that I can feel. I can hear it anyway. So anyway, I live in Ireland. So I think most of us here are in Ireland, but Eileen who's in, has lovely blue sky today. And when I meet people around here, people always, often, not always, often ask me, where are you from? And when I say I'm from uh, a, trop sorry, a tropical island, uh, I always get, um, what are you doing here? Could you not have stayed in your tropical island? So in January 2018, my husband, who is also from the country where I am from, decided to go back to our own uh, home country. So that was us in January 2018. So we left everything. So we sold, you know, our cars. We were renting a house. We we took a container and we decided to go back home. Um, at the time, I had a uh, nine months old and a two-year-old. So, however, this is us again in Dublin Airport, nine months later with a three-year-old and a one-year-old. So they'd, they'd been promoted in age by that time. And it didn't work out the way we wanted. So uh, we had dreams, we had expectations, we had um, things that we wanted to accomplish and for some reason it just didn't work out so we just we, we made the, the tough decision to come back that meant leaving our families behind because our four parents so his parents and my parents are there and all our extended families and it also meant coming back from uh summer sorry i can't there we go 
it meant coming back from uh, summer. So you see the blue sky, uh, a little hello to Spain, the island, and then coming back to the autumn because we were back in October. And that was uh, the beginning of, of an, an, a big journey uh, here. So it meant um, that we had decided as a, as a family that I was going to go on a career break. So I was working when I was back home. Um, we had to find you know, a place to rent. We couldn't buy. We were in an Airbnb for a good while. I, I always joke, I still joke about, can someone switch the sun back on? Because we had so much light there. And when we came here, it was cold. I remember my kids being, you know, <laughs> using the bathroom and saying, why is it so cold? And not being able to do anything about this. And I think what really kept me going all the way was resilience. And it is, it is only, you know, when I look back, you know, it's a bit of a blur because for two years, it was quite, uh, sorry, um, it was quite, um, it had it had it was it was a blur and it was at the same time there was things we wanted to do and had to do so in, we bought a house we I started a business things have moved but what really kept me going was resilience so before we go into uh, more of this presentation and uh, this session I wanted to ask you about your thoughts about resilience what it means to you what words and maybe and chat among, amongst yourself uh, to talk about this. Uh, Tanya is going to help me with the breakout rooms and we'll come back in 10 minutes. Welcome back everybody. Um, I think there was some great chats being had there. I popped in and out of one or two of the rooms um, with the intention of joining conversation, but there was just so much, so much good stuff being said and being shared. Uh, it was really, really nice to hear. Great. Thanks, Tanya. And I'd love to, to hear uh, if, you know, if, if there's anybody who wants to share anything on, on those lovely discussions, please. I'm happy to share something. Yeah. Um, yeah, so myself and Finton were having a chat. Thank you, Finton. And um, we were just looking at the difference in resilience um, that happens because of age and the difference for millennials compared to old and crusty people like me um, and just seeing that really when you when you get to a certain age you have enough life experience and you've pulled yourself out of the base so often that you if you're aware you've grown an awareness of what pulls you out but as you are younger you haven't lived that experience necessarily and failure is bad um, whereas when you get to my age it's like yeah okay all right do it again you know um, and you're far more accepting of your own mistakes, your own errors. So mm -hmm. that resilience is remarkably different depending on your age and exposure. That was kind of what we came up with. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting and useful one. Yeah, thank you, Eileen. Anybody else? Um, um, I'll speak if you'd like. Um, we had Billy, Sharon and Siobhan mm -hmm. um, and we had great sharing. So thank you guys. And we, we spoke a lot about really honoring our humanness of how we're feeling at any one time. But it was so important to how we empower ourselves to move on from that as well. So yes, honor your room and then move on. But also the refractory period, how long are we going to stay in that story and become stuck versus what you can do every day to fill your own cup first. So little, small, little timeouts for ourselves to build our own inner winning muscle so mm -hmm. that we are, you know, building stronger muscle in that regard uh, so that we, in times of crisis or whatever, that we can bounce back a lot stronger and quicker from a situation um, and even remain quite okay on the inside while it's going on as well. Um, but also being present Mm -hmm. um in that moment is so important as well as just running from it oh so, yeah 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 that's that's so uh, that's so important i think to be able to um it's like having having tools so that you can you can use them Toolbox. when the time comes yeah 
Yeah. 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 We talked about self-regulating as well, actually. That was another one. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Deidre, yes. for, for sharing. You're welcome. So, if anybody else don't have anything, if would anybody else want to share something? Otherwise, I'll, I'll keep going. To share again. So, so the meaning of re- resilience. So, uh, one of the um, lines that really. Um, struck me was uh, someone called Amit Sood who described resilience as the core strength you use to lift the load of life and how you know you, you what you a bit of what you said you were having tools having um uh, the help you know that you might need to lift whatever uh, comes comes in front of us and why resilience is important um so it's Influence it can influence work satisfaction and engagement, our well being. It can decrease depression levels and protect us from uh, physical illness. And low levels of resilience would be the opposite of all the so feelings of being overwhelmed and helpless and uh, likely to rely on coping strategies that might not be too healthy, like avoidance, you know. Uh, isolation, numbing, doing things that uh, just take away whatever suffering we might be going through. Um, I'm not going to go through some findings of, of two studies that um, are uh, that I found interesting. So obviously we weren't going to not talk about the C word. Uh, so this is this first one is a study of 25,000 working adults in 25 different countries done in July 2020. And they found that the more people were exposed to COVID, the higher rev- levels of resilience they had. So when they when people were exposed themselves and then their family members were exposed, they found that there were higher levels of resilience. And also those who have were impacted by changes to their working conditions. So they had five changes. So they could have lost a job, their finances could have been uh, affected. Uh, They were 13 times more resilient. And the authors were saying how it is when we face that reality and see that we are in a difficult situation, this is when we really find our basis for resilience because while it, like Deirdre was saying earlier it's important to have tools it's also when we are faced with something that we are able to you know it's that feeling of when you sink in the water then you really struggle and come back up for air and uh, how sometimes when we see somebody are suffering we we go uh, you know with a with a difficulty we go I couldn't do that. But how also the real is often less scary than than what we imagine it to be. So that was one study. The other one, sorry, was um, a study to quantify the, the effect, the psychological effects of the pandemic. So in spring 2020, um, these authors found that there was um, an increase in psychological distress, so in anxiety, uh, distress, depression. But then what they found was, you know, they, they were sure that the level of well-being was going to go down, but that in late spring and summer, the levels of psychological distress began to fall. While they, they, they really stressed on the fact they don't want to minimize that, you know, the pain and the loss that some people endured uh, is very real. However, there were many survivors, you know, you know, of not only the pandemic, but also survivors of war that bounced back quickly and never re- really show any substantial decline in mental health. So what their conclusion were is that as human beings, we are not passive victims of change, of, of sorry, uh, passive victims of change we really want to take our own well-being and when we are faced with difficulty with um, obstacles we, we strive to do to go above them we strive to go back to as a new or somehow changed state of well-being um, 
I read this lovely book um, of um, by Matt Haig, the the comfort book, which is really it really brings a lot of comfort. And he talks about uh, the song somewhere over the rainbow in the Wizard of Oz, how uh, this song was actually written in 1939. I didn't know that, uh, so uh, it was written in 1939 in the midst of um, you know one of the hardest time of uh, in human human history and how the author somehow managed to write such a lovely song which always I was listening to it yesterday how it brings so much uh, hope to whatever is going on and so as a conclusion the authors were saying that that this global psychological immune system that we have has been put to test with the COVID pandemic and that it proved to be at uh, its strongest because we have found ways around this. Um, so before I move on, would you have any questions, any comments? Any reactions? Keep going. Um, so how to build resilience then? So I'm going to talk about three points. The first one is the our connection with others and how um, building relationships and networks can really help. Because when we are in, you know, stuck in a rut, uh, the interactions with others can help us shift our perspectives and also get help and laugh about stuff that, that is happening. And we definitely saw that over the pandemic, how uh, we were really craving for connections. We used Zoom so much. And the Dirty Salad Club definitely seemed to have been one of them because while I, I wasn't um, in here at, at the start of the pandemic, over and over I've heard people say how this was a, a life saviour to be able to connect with others so that's that's one of them and if i link this back to my own story when i moved in uh, I, I moved to a different place so we were living in dublin so we decided to move to wicklow because our friends we had one couple who had a, a two-year-old as well at the time so my son was able to go to school with him so it really meant a lot for us to be able to go with where, where we knew somebody uh, when I, while I, I was on that, my career break, I went to all the playgroups with my one-year-old and uh, over the pandemic, these people that I've met and, um, you know, built relationships with have been, have been so helpful and now they're, they're really good friends. And I also started sea swimming because I'm lucky to live by the beach. And I think this also, while there, there's a lovely community, I think, um, being you know from this tropical island where the sea water is always in its 20s and going in the sea water here somehow you know taught me to be you know unconsciously being uh, comfortable with an uncomfortable situation the second point um uh the second way uh, about um uh, building resilience is uh, finding a purpose in life. So uh, over the while I was preparing this talk, there's a number of, of, um, of articles, you know, books that led towards this concept. So finding your purpose in life. So there's a Japanese concept, I'm sure many of you might be familiar with that, called Ikigai, so a reason to live. And people in the blue zones, so who have uh, one of the worlds have uh, the highest life expect expectancy in the world are those, one of their features is that they have a clearly defined purpose. So clearly defined Ikigai, they never give up, they keep going, whatever happens. And uh, in his book, um, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, who is a survivor of the Holocaust and who was living in uh, concentration camps and lost his, his wife and stresses on how he in the face of death you know he was really able to focus on his purpose he talks about how he really had to face death and still go above that and still think about why he was there and being comfortable with the idea that you know it might happen uh, that kept him going and he eventually survived and told his story in in this book and 
I love this quote where he says, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Um, and if I think back to my own um, uh, story, I, I knew the reason why I left my home country. I had the goal in, my, for, uh, in mind for me and for my family. There were loads of hurdles. Um, uh, you know, keeping asking myself and with my husband ourselves whether we had done the right thing or not. But in the end, you know, I knew what I didn't want and I knew why I was here. Uh, the last the last thing brings um, the last point I want to talk about is uh, uh, from the book called Grit by Angela Duckworth, which maybe some of you have read, and she talks about four in four points that she calls, you know, paragons of grit have. So people who really keep going, who really have shown um, high levels of resilience. So they have uh, interest, practice, purpose, and hope. So interest in, the, in that they know what they really love doing. Even if it's not um, uh, something they excel at, they work hard at it, so they practice, they keep focusing. They don't, they, they don't focus on what is going well as much as they focus on what is going wrong and how can I improve it? And the purpose, which brings back to, us back to the second point I was talking about, and hope, so not the kind of hope with, to do with the luck, uh, but the kind of hope to, to be able to get up every time we fall down. And which brings me to the to the third point that, that was um, very um, well explored by Carol Dweck, which is her concept of the growth mindset. So cultivating a growth mindset, because um, Angela Duckworth talks in her book how she found that talent and intelligence are not alone don't predict success. Uh, on the other hand, it is effort. It is uh, falling down, getting up, trying again and again and testing and how the way to build grit. So this perseverance is to try and cultivate a growth mindset. So with our children, with our clients, because if we use these kinds of um, if we use, uh, if we are used to having a growth mindset, then we know that you know there's always a way of improving, and there's always another uh, perspective to what we might be uh, to what we might be uh, enduring if it is a difficult situation. Uh, so. Again, with, with me, I, I tried to fit in loads of groups. Sometimes I found myself to be very lonely in a, in a group, even in the play groups, you know, there were micro, micro groups going on. I was in, in a WhatsApp group that I felt uh, I didn't belong to. And while it was hard to, to tell myself I was going to leave it, I had to leave. I really had to leave it because of how I felt. Um, and uh, I started a business when I was in my in my home country, but it didn't work out at all. So I had to step back, you know, uh, stop it. But I've when I came here after you know we settled and you know the kids were in school and everything, I went back to college and I've set up a new business now. Uh, so um, let's hope it it works better. It is still a work in progress. So I might have another resilience story after this. I don't know. So, so that's that brings me to the end of uh, of this session, and there's a lovely uh, uh, paragraph from Theodore Roosevelt that Brené Brown talks about in her in her book Rising Strong that I'll just read to you. So it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, and who becomes short again and again, because there is no effort without error. So the fact that really, you know, it is okay to fall, it is okay, and, and Brené Brown explores this uh, absolutely 
fantastically well how it is when we are down that we are able to gather our strength before a strength before we we rise again so these are the resources and thank you very much and so somewhere with the rainbow the skies are blue <laughs> thank you thanks so much farzana thank you um, I think this feels like a real love in all that Victor Frankel, Brené Brown, Angela Duckworth, um, all those names I think lots of us are very familiar with. Uh, really, really fantastic. Thank you. So any questions, any reactions? I'd, I'd love for you to, to, to maybe share your own, own feelings and your own uh, uh, stories with regards to these. Stop sharing for a second. It's great, uh, Franza, the way you, uh, you've, not only have you got the research, but I love the way you've, uh, you've noticed and observed how you've used it along the way and how it's helped you, which is really magnificent. Thank Most you. people just rattle off the research, but you've rattled off the connections to your own situation, which is wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. It's it's this. I, I was also really. It really br brought me back to all of this when I was getting ready for this session. Yeah, so thank yeah. you so much for the opportunity uh, to all yeah. of you. See what you've learned from. It's great. Thank you. Anybody else? I, I just to it. I just throw in a quote as well. I mean, again, far, far away from Victor Frankl, Grayson Perry, you know, the artist. Um, <laughs> he's brilliant, actually. I saw him on stage uh, doing a talk. But I did a great one, which kind of relates to where you were, were in that last section there. Like he says, how about you? If you don't have self-doubt, you're not trying hard enough. Yeah. I love yeah. this. Uh, yeah. And I thought as an artist, but that, that, that applies to us all, you know. So yeah. that was a great quote, yeah. Where did you see him, Billy? Uh, I just saw him at the National Concert Hall. Oh, wow. He did, he did a one-man uh, kind of audience interaction piece a yeah. number of years ago. It was yeah. all around Brexit, actually, at the time he was looking at. Oh, wow. He was discussing Brexit, but uh, he, he can be quite, quite interesting. I read a few of his books yeah. as well. They're, they're quite, quite good. Love, it's, yeah. it's an alternative take on, on the art world. <laughs> He's great. And, it's, and Carol Tweck does that as well. She talks about, you know, the way you normally come home to your kids and you say, to have a great day, mm. you know, feeding the next generation of narcissism. She says, <laughs> come home and say to them, who gave something a go today, but you made a mess of it? Yeah. So it's normal. So it's actually about the go rather than the Feel forward. Yeah, yeah. lovely. Yeah. I keep and thinking then, of... Yeah. Sorry, Tanya. Um, I've... What was I going to, I've lost my train of thought now, Alan. What was I going to say? I, did that. <laughs> I keep thinking of... You know how resilience previously I feel often used to be defined in some some shape or form as bouncing back but this whole idea that you're never going back you know it's right. it's progress it's yeah it's being in yeah. the arena it's learning from those mistakes yeah. it's yeah. when all of the shit hits the fan and everything but it's <laughs> it's progress and you're you know that bouncing forward going forward yeah yeah I, don't know. I wonder can you also overshare because I I really live Carol Dweck's and I was sharing mistakes every night and my boy who's 10 said to me geez dad no adult would ever feel like a failure once they meet you. <laughs> Rosanna, thank you so much for that. It's Nia here. Um, I'm doing some work with uh, some leadership groups, so it's great to have some new material that I'll be able to inter interweave tomorrow and uh, next week when I'm doing the programme. So appreciate that and uh, some of the books as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks. Thank you, Frizana. It was great. I love the reminder of the finding your why. I think that's really powerful when, you know, everything piles on and finding your why is really, really important. So thank you for that reminder. And I love the Somewhere Over the Rainbow reminder as well. I love that song. I didn't realise it was composed during that time. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think Matt Haig's book has lovely little snippets of things. Yeah, I'm going to go and search it out, actually. I've read a few of his books, The Midnight Library and some of those, but I haven't yeah, read that one. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's another great one. I, I, I read the two, one after the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. So I'll just share again for um, 
Tanya, thank you so much, everyone. Rosanna, just one question. We're very curious in our group um, as to where, where that tropical island is. <laughs> We have a guest. <laughs> I, I thought Mauritius, maybe. But, yeah. yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh, okay. okay yeah, so you are going to ask me what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> I have some friends from Mauritius as well. So. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. They live here. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. In, yeah. in Dublin, on the north side, though, so a bit far away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they love it here as well, so it's just different, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. The north side is not so far away, really. <laughs> As a north sider. Uh, Wicklow. My sister lives in Wicklow, so she feels it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you, Sharon. <laughs> it's less tropical, Sharon. It is less tropical. As a former south sider, we have converted. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, I just thanks, want Rosanna. to um, Tanya for uh, the ending. Thanks, Tanya. Yeah. Thanks, Inch Lions. Thank you, Farzana. I think that was really, really fantastic. Really, really great session. Um, so just before we, we finish up and let everybody go, next month we have our very own Billy Byrne, uh, who's up on the 23rd of March. Billy's going to be talking about the roles of diversity and dissent uh, in team and group decision making. Uh, so really, really looking forward to that one. I think we've all probably heard a lot about the importance of diversity in groups and teams for decision making. Billy's going to extend that a little bit further, looking at, you know, how we gen generally tend to want to conform, uh, but how, how dissent and constructive dissent is really, really important for team and group decision making. So we'll be looking forward to that one with Billy. If anybody here would like to host any upcoming sessions, we'd love to have you. Even if you've hosted before, we'd love to have you again. Um, and as I say, it's not about you, the host, being an expert, knowing everything about a subject. It's you sharing your thoughts, perspectives, us all learning from each other and talking together. Uh, so please give us a shout if you would like to host. The recording of today's session and the slides from today's session will be up on our Dirty Salad Club LinkedIn page by tomorrow, if not before. And we'll send you a link for next month's session for, for uh, 23rd of March with Billy as well. So thanks so much, folks. It's been really nice to see thanks, everybody. Uh, really nice to get to know some of the new the new faces and that. And we hope to see you back soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.